Hello, I'm Kent Myers. I'm Mick Cornett, and it's time for the verdict. As a part of its traditional and continuing commitment to public and community service, Crow and Dunleavy Law Firm presents The Verdict, an objective discussion of contemporary legal issues hosted by Kent Myers. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma. And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornack. Well, if you were a first-time viewer to our program, you should know that we meet here each week to discuss topical legal issues. And to get us started, let me introduce one of Oklahoma's top legal experts and my co-host, Kent Myers. Kent, you've chosen a good one today, the separation of church and state. Yes, it's a, an issue about which there is a heated debate. Seldom do you see people discuss it, uh, agreeably at least, but I hope we do today. Uh, it's, a, it's a subject that's really confusing. On our currency, in God we trust, that apparently is okay. And the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, that apparently is okay. On the other hand, you can say that in school, but you can't have a prayer in school, and you can't have a silent prayer in school. And Edmond, the city of Edmond, had to take the uh, cross out of its seal. Seemingly conflict conflicting rules, don't know how we decide what's all right and what isn't. And now President Bush has talked about uh, starting uh, nationally faith-based initiatives, uh, charitable choice, uh, how that's going to involve churches with the government. I think we've got a fascinating show today and two great guests. We do have two great guests, and we'll be meeting them in just a few moments. It's an interesting topic, the separation of church and state, and it should be a lively discussion right here on The Verdict. It's got to be around here somewhere. Don't worry, we'll find it. Just calm down. I swear it was right here on the desk. All right, if I were a Will, where would I be? It's the only copy. Without it, we're out three million. I know, I know. Hey, accidents happen. If a condom breaks or you have unprotected sex. You have 72 hours to reduce your risk of getting pregnant. It's called emergency contraception. Got questions? Call Planned Parenthood. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405-23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. And welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and we're ready to discuss this issue of the separation between church and state. Again, why don't you introduce our guests? We have two people that really know about that subject, Mick. We're pleased to have them. On my right is Michael Salem, an attorney from Norman, Oklahoma. Michael uh, handles a number of church-state cases. He's a University of Oklahoma electrical engineering graduate. Uh, he has his master's in public administration as well as his juris, juris doctorate degree. Michael, glad to have you. Glad to be here. On my left is Jerry Regeer. 
Jerry is the uh, Secretary for the uh, Health and Human Services Cabinet position for Governor Keating. He is the Acting Director of the Oklahoma State Department of Health. He has a BA, a, a, a Master's of Public Administration as well uh, from Harvard University. And um, as uh, recently uh, by President, well, when President Reagan was in office, appointed uh, Jerry to the National Commission on Children. Uh, Jerry, glad to have you. Glad to be here. Let's look uh, at a graphic <clears throat> right off the bat uh, to look at our Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Michael, let me start with you. We titled this thing Separation of Church and State. Separation doesn't appear in there. How did that separation of church and state ever come about? It's all traceable back to the founders. Thomas Jefferson was a proponent of uh, the separation of church and state. And in a letter that he wrote to the Danbury Baptist in 1802, he talked to them about a wall of separation. Jefferson was actually preaching to the choir because the Baptists were very much concerned, at least back in, in Danbury in 1802, were very much concerned about the issue of separation of church and state. And so when Jefferson told them that he imagined a wall of, of separation between church and state, he was telling them what they wanted to uh, hear. And so it's, it's that turn of the phrase that has been adopted by the court was first used in a polygamy case by the United States Supreme Court and has since been quoted many times that it's come into the popular lore and the language that uh, we use. So separation isn't in the Constitution. Not it's at in all. the cases yeah. thanks to Thomas Jefferson. That's right. Well, let me ask Jerry. Jerry, we say on our currency, in God we trust. I picked a one because that's uh, all I had. <laughs> it was the only one I had. But in any event, it's on all of our currency. Is that okay? Is that appropriate? Well, I think it is appropriate. Why I, isn't that a violation of and, separation of church and state? And, and I think the uh, the whole idea of separation of church and state is has really gotten to myth proportions, and uh, people, you know, see that word and almost think that people of faith and people with religious beliefs cannot even participate in public policy. I mean, it's gotten to that extent almost, and uh, I don't think that's what the founders had in mind at all. If you look back on some of the writings, they were certainly encouraging religion. They were religious people themselves. And so I think it's gotten a little out of hand. Well, we allow, uh, apparently, to say that we're allowed to say the Pledge of Allegiance, saying one nation under God, but we're not allowed to have a prayer in school. Do you think that's correct? Well, again, you know, we're wrestling with this. You know, we, we also have a chaplain at the U.S. Senate who opens uh, every, every day with, with prayer, and it's paid for by government funds, by the, by the U.S. Senate. So I think that we're, we're, we're trying to find where the balance is between that Establishment Clause and, and, and the, the uh, uh, being able to go forward with our religious beliefs. Well, Michael, let's look at another graphic, something you had a lot to do with. Let's look at the seal of the city of Edmond. Uh, in uh, the corner of it there, you see a prominent cross. That cross is not there any longer. I don't think, or at least it's not supposed to be, because of a decision in which you were involved. Tell us about the, what was involved in removing the cross from the seal of the city of Edmond and why that was perceived to be a problem. Well, I think that we all have to be concerned about whether or not our government institutions remain free of uh, what would otherwise be known as sectarian uh, influences. And in this instance, the cross on the seal of the city of Edmond constituted a form of endorsement. And, and what the court said was, in analyzing this, that uh, there, there's basically three tests that are looked at, purpose, effect, and entanglement. And as the court decisions have sort of melded together, they've taken the first two, purpose and effect, and treated it as an endorsement. Now, the question here is, to the average observer, and this is how the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit viewed it, does the average observer, looking at that seal, do they consider that that cross represents a form of endorsement by the city of Edmond? And the answer to that, uh, as decided by the court, was that yes, it does. Now, these things don't exist necessarily in a vacuum, and I, I have to identify at least that, you know, my clients were non-Christian, or at least some of them professed certain Christian beliefs, but they were not Christian beliefs that, that uh, necessarily believed in the fact that 
Uh, they, they termed the cross, for example, a form of blood sacrifice, which they didn't believe in, an Old Testament type. One of my clients was Jewish. And of course, the cross to him would represent an anathema. Every month, he gets a water bill from the city of Edmond that contains a cross on it. When he opens that water bill and gets a very personal reminder from the government that it favors, or at least through its symbols, endorses or provides some kind of support or endorsement for religious belief, not his own. That was, the, I think, the essence of the violation. Jerry? Well, I think the courts have really gone too far. Uh, I think that they are removing symbols such as what Michael is talking about unnecessarily. I don't think the average person uh, sees that as, as a sectarian message. I think they see it as a historical message. Uh, it's, it's got some history in terms of, of the city itself. It's got some history certainly in our, in our own history as a country. And um, uh, that along with other kinds of things like removing creches from, from the uh, uh, public square. I, I just think that the uh, courts have really gone too far. How does the court make a determination, Michael, between whether something is a symbol or it's, or it's historical? Well, actually what the court does is it decides these on a case-by-case -case basis. In actuality, the court hasn't removed creches from public squares. In one particular case, they allowed a creche to, uh, in an area that was adjacent mm -hmm. to a courthouse. In another one, they removed a creche that was uh, a nativity scene that was placed in the courthouse itself on a landing in the stairs where everybody who came in uh, would get to see that during Christmas time and the court says that this constitutes a form of endorsement an endorsement of a religious belief and so the court makes these individually they make them based upon uh, a case-by-case -case basis. Has the court gone too far? No I don't think the court has gone too far I think the court tries to, to, and struggles perhaps like we all do to, to make a balance about these particular issues um, weighing for example whether or not a prayer at a football game in Texas you know, constitutes an endorsement is a very difficult decision. But uh, weighing whether or not, for example, a prayer offered at a graduation in Rhode Island is, uh, was a very difficult decision for the court. And if you really looked at that, the question that the court looks at is, is this an endorsement or a form of support by the government? And the Constitution, at least in the, uh, the term that we use, uh, the separation of church and state, uh, at least provides some kind of promise to each of us that our government will not tacitly or directly support some other religious belief. We're going to have to stop it right there, interrupt, take a short break. We're discussing the issue of the separation of church and state. We'll be right back. What's your verdict? stuff. Campfires for boys too, not just girls. But hey, campfires definitely for kids. So call the campfire office nearest you to join in on the fun. Cause let's face it, you're not getting any younger. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education balanced with dedication to community and service makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the, of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice. justice for all. Every day Americans make this pledge, but few think about its significance. It's our job to make justice a reality by providing legal representation for all citizens. Legal services, keeping the promise of America. Every day, in state governments throughout the country, crucial decisions are being made that affect the lives of children and their families. But as this process takes place, children are often left voiceless. When these children raise their hands to be heard, is anyone listening? There are people listening. 
They are child advocates. Join us and raise your hand for kids. And welcome back. Well, we are discussing the issues involving the separation of church and state. We're here on The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Uh, Mick and guests, uh, George W. Bush has introduced, at least nationally, a concept of faith-based initiatives. Uh, that's some, that has something to do with the subject we're talking about today. And Jerry, would you please tell our viewers what you understand that to be along with charitable choice? Well, anytime they talk about faith-based initiatives, they're talking about organizations that are based on a faith and uh, having them perform services, social services, services for the community that would be similar to what government services provide, particularly in the social services area. Can you give me two or three examples? Well, it would be an example would be uh, after school mentoring, could be a soup kitchen, uh, could be uh, child care, you know, different areas that, uh, that they would provide it. Charitable Choice came in actually as part of the uh, welfare reform in 1996 and uh, charitable choice in essence says we want to first of all we want to level the playing field between between the non-faith-based and the faith-based oh, okay. because there were some areas where faith-based organizations felt excluded in terms of applying for a grant or, or applying for uh, being able to provide those kinds of services. Well, why, why would they feel that way? Were there some restrictions on the, uh, on the agencies that provided the uh, services? Actually, uh, uh, I think it was twofold. One is that there are some restrictions in some states that make it very difficult, but uh, the other is probably the myth that I talked about earlier, and that is the myth that we can't play in that arena at all. And so it was, it was leveling that playing field so that there's no discrimination. And then secondly, uh, doing so without compromising the, the, the message or the mission of the faith-based organization. And the third purpose was to not have any coercion for the people being served. Well, so if a service was being provided to resident A of Oklahoma, uh, a meal, we'll say, what can and, and uh, the uh, provider that's uh, from a church do now under faith-based and what can't they do uh, as opposed to what was well, previously chari provided? Well, Charitable Choice specifically talks about uh, that it should serve a secular purpose. So, so providing a meal to somebody who otherwise wouldn't get a meal would certainly be a secular purpose. If they went the next step and said, to get this meal, we want you to listen to 30 minutes of a Bible uh, message or we want you to join this group in prayer and then we'll give you the meal. Uh, that would be coercion and, and that would not be acceptable. But they can go ahead and tell them this is provided to you by uh, the First Baptist Church of Oklahoma City. Oh, certainly. They don't have to, they don't have to uh, uh, waffle in terms of who they are, in terms of what they have on the wall. Uh, those the napkins can have a cross on it, whatever uh, they exactly. want. Exactly. Right. And there are some who actually would take it another step and say that if the client has, has the opportunity and the choice to have that same meal down the street at a place that is not connected to a church, that, they, that, that then with that kind of uh, flexibility and volunteer uh, effort, that they should be able to even uh, actually talk a little more. Michael, is this needed? Do we need faith-based initiatives to provide services to our citizens? I think that it's problematic at best because what will happen is, is that, first of all, the government only has limited resources. And then how do you select and on what basis do you make the selection of which program is worthy and which are not? And how do you assure that that selection doesn't favor, for example, some religious belief that uh, may be uh, more related to the person who's making those choices? That's the first part about it. The second thing is, is, is that uh, government money that is being used by these organizations uh, is, must always be accountable. I mean, you know, you might have the auditor and inspector come down and want to know uh, just exactly what you're doing. And so all of a sudden the churches, I think, at least to in ensure government accountability, has to open up their books to the uh, government auditor who comes in and wants to find out whether or not they're spending the money properly. The third problem that I have with it is that in some ways this can be a, um, a subsidy to the religious organization. 
Now, Jerry mentioned uh, the founders earlier about how that they were people who were religious, and, and, and that is true. And, and they, weren't, uh, they weren't necessarily people who were not practical politicians. They understood that, that making uh, popular statements about religion was, was good with the voters. But, for example, Thomas Jefferson, if you read his autobiography, talks about the fact that the Anglican Church was supported in Virginia and how the ministers received money from the government as well as they were farmers themselves. And what, was, what he concerned about, he talked about the tyranny, for example, of Quakers who lived in Virginia who were compelled to pay taxes to the support of a religious organization, the Anglican Church. Madison wrote a, a, a very well-known, at least I guess in legal circles, document called the Memorial and Remonstrance Against Religious Assessments, talking about taxes that were being taken and used for religious purposes. But we're not doing that with faith-based well, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because what happens, for example, is, is, is that let's say that you have a certain amount of money that's part of a grant. And as a part of that faith-based initiative, the religious organization decides that they want to take a building that they've already gotten, uh, and it's paid for or whatever, <coughs> and they're going to place this religious program, or excuse me, this program to provide a soup kitchen or whatever within that. Well, of course, they may be entitled to receive some rent. So now they're receiving rent. So the money the would money. indirectly go to rent. Well, would indirectly, be the that's right. Indirectly or directly, a building that's already existed, uh, it would obviously offset money that they would have to come up with otherwise. And see, this has been going on for years. I mean, I mean, you have substance abuse groups that meet in churches. You have uh, domestic violence groups that meet in churches. So I mean, that's really nothing new. Well, let me change the question a little bit. Uh, I tell you, Kent, we're really going to have to sum this up. We're going to have a, a summary from each of them. Let's do. All right. Michael, why don't you go first, sum up your thoughts on these, really the two issues that we've been discussing today, separation of church and state and faith-based initiatives. The separation of church and state, I think, uh, gets a lot of bad play because sometimes, at least, the court decisions are not properly mm -hmm. explained by the media. And perhaps people, of course, you know, in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives don't find out exactly what the problems are. You know, the idea of prayer in school, I think, is really the most critical. People who send their children to school don't send those children to a public school. In a private school, of course, it's entirely appropriate. It's, it's, it's certainly something that probably is even sought out in some instances. People don't send their children to a public school to be proselytized by religious beliefs that are not of their own. I don't know why anybody would trust the two most important things in their life, their children and their religious beliefs, to public schools or any public officials. I mean, these people can't even build roads correctly sometimes. You know. Well, Mick won't take personal offense to that. <laughs> Jerry, a final word from you. Well, when we have uh, uh, tragedies in, in our society, like a bombing or a tornado, religious groups come out of the woodwork and we praise them for the way that they assist and the way that they help. And we have some real tragedies in our social services. And religious groups, many times, faith-based organizations, have really seen results. And we as taxpayers, I think, should base it on results and, and whether these programs are working or not. And uh, bringing them into the orbit is really what this is about, not giving them advantage. We're going to have to wrap it up right there. Mr. Regeer, Mr. Salem, thank you both for coming in. Kent and I will return for a few final thoughts when we get back. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. In Oklahoma, there are more than 1,600 children waiting to be adopted. They're of all ages, and for many, home has been a source of pain and conflict. They've dreamed of finding a better life and a loving family. Consider adoption. For more information, call 1-877-OK-SWIFT or visit the website www.okdhs.org. Adopt. It may be the toughest job you'll ever love.
bringing out the best in each student. That is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities. Parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. And welcome back to The Verdict. Well, Kent, this is an issue that's been discussed for a couple hundred years now. I don't know that we're going to be able to wrap it up here in a minute and a half, but do your best. Well, we'll try. Uh, this faith-based initiative argument is going to bring to the forefront again the church and state controversy. Uh, already we're seeing in surveys uh, that uh, many of the churches, in fact most of the churches surveyed in Oklahoma, have some concern that accepting the money that will be coming with faith-based initiatives will perhaps compromise their church missions. By the same token, a nationwide survey uh, showed that almost half of the people surveyed uh, didn't want money to go to the Buddhists, to the Church of Scientology, to the uh, Nation of Islam, uh, to the Muslims. Uh, so some churches want some churches to get the money and not other churches. It's okay if it's their church, but not necessarily any church. That's right. And if we aren't worried about proselytization, which is hard enough to say, much less to understand, <laughs> why are they concerned about which churches get it if it's not going to happen? It's, a, it's a really a subject that is going to stay on the forefront because Governor Keating's in favor of it and uh, President Bush is in favor of it. And we're trending in that direction. We're trending in that direction, and the Supreme Court's becoming more conservative all the time. Sounds like another, few, another show coming up. Uh, it's very possible. All right. Hey, thanks for joining us again. Thanks to our guests also, Michael Salem and Jerry Regeer. And I hope you'll join us next time right here on The Verdict. This program was brought to you by Crow and Dunleavy, a professional corporation. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma.